as one person and I haven't hit that yet, but it's easily it's from what I'm looking at, it's easily like $50,000 plus a year. Hey everyone, welcome to another edition of PSI, Prof Sales Interviews, where we uncover the why, how, and what of how to make money online. And I am very excited to talk to today's guest, Eric Spears, also known as the College Picker. Eric is a friend of mine who I've known for several years now, and he's been reselling online for over 10 years. And you're going to hear about his journey from flipping motorcycle parts on Craigslist to traveling the country as a digital nomad, working part-time as a pharmacist, and also making a living reselling along the way while living out of his van. So Eric's got this amazing evolution, this amazing story. He's one of the smartest guys I know, and I know you're gonna love hearing about it, and also hearing about his latest venture where he thinks he can make $50,000 a year just selling computers on Facebook. So let's jump right in and talk to Eric. All right, Eric, thanks again for joining us today. So I've got a lot of questions to you about a lot of things you've done over the last, oh, it's been like 13 years since you started this journey, it seems like. And the first question I have is around your why, like why you got into this. But I know that you have a pharmaceutical background. You went to school, you have been doing, you've done pharmaceutical contract. And a lot of people out there are probably wondering, hey, you know, pharmacology, being a pharmacist, that pays pretty good money. Um, And I know, I know you've done a good bit of it. So, you know, what kind of, I don't want to say soured you on that, because I don't think you got soured on it. You seem to really like it from all the videos you've done. But, you know, why not just stick down that route? What, what were you looking to get that it wasn't maybe fulfilling for you? So if you, well, first of all, thanks for having me on. I appreciate you putting it together and inviting me to come onto the channel. And thanks everyone that's actually watching this, taking the time out of your day. Do appreciate that. But when it comes to pharmacy, there's, um, there's a lot of corporate stuff, especially with like the big chains. I don't know if I should name any of them, but like grocery stores and pharmacy chains, there's a lot of like corporate metrics. They're always on your butt. I bet that's very relatable to a lot of people that have worked uh, traditional nine to five jobs where you got to do this, 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 you got to have enough flu shots. You got to have enough scripts and we're not going to give you enough help for it because we want to make our bottom line better. So it's like a lot of that bull crap that. Uh, I, I noticed back in 2014, I think it was 2014 when I first started working with a chain, I was like dragging my feet. I, I didn't, wasn't excited to go to work. I just was, my body was saying, no, like, do not, you, you're not happy. You're not, you're not having fun. You're not being fulfilled doing this. So I totally shifted away from like corporate pharmacy and then went more of uh, I, you could say it's more of an entrepreneurial way because I'm getting paid a 1099 and I'm not loyal to a company. And that was more of like the contracting stuff. Um, but the, the salaries are good. But it, in the end of the day, you got to show up. You have to meet the metrics. And if you don't, you're just below the yeah. boss and he, they talk down on you. And it's just, I don't know. It's, it's like the hierarchy. And I don't so it just it's not, didn't feel not, right. So you're not in charge. It sounds like what you're saying. You're not in charge. You're not kind of in control of your destiny there. You're having to put up with, you know, the normal corporate momo jumbo. Yeah. And there's no end in sight. So whenever you mm-hmm. go into a pharmacy and if you see the pharmacist in the back, usually they're in a bad mood. Usually they're overweight. They're not happy. The, mm-hmm. the salary is good. Um, starting pay is anywhere between 90 to $120,000 most places. Right, so the pay is good. good. Benefits are great. Stock options are usually great. Insurance is great. And it just, you trade a lot of that for your soul and, and really like the no end of being like the corporate, I don't know. It's just the guys there that I would talk to would have been working for like 10, 15 years. And they're like not even close to retiring right. or anything just because their lifestyle kind of creeps too with that culture. Mm. Uh, it, it, it's something that I really haven't, wasn't into. I like, I didn't, and I didn't get a new car for so long after I graduated. And even now I don't even have that. I have like a $10,000 car. So it's like not even anything special. So that makes sense why you kind of, you know, saw like the handwriting on the wall and said, you know, I'm going to have to do all these things. The people that are doing it maybe aren't having the best. Um, it's not really turning out maybe the way they thought, or maybe the way you would have thought it would have done either. And so you would have given up a lot of things. So it makes sense that you would seek to pivot and go in Mm -hmm. a different direction. 
But without getting into all the details yet, which we'll talk about here in a moment, why reselling? Why why get online and start selling things? What what drew you to that? Because I had already done it throughout school. It was something I was already educated on. Um, I started flipping stuff like back in 2007, I think, off of Craigslist motorcycles, buy them on Craigslist, sell them back on Craigslist, or part out the parts on eBay. And I knew how to do that. So I, I had already had my hands in thrifting. I've had my hands in like Craigslist flips, and I kind of understood hard good markets, soft good markets. So it was something I already knew. And it just was, it felt safer because it's like, I, I've been doing this for such a long time. I've been doing this for, I think at that point, if I had graduated, it was 2014. So I had already been doing it for close to seven years of experience when I had graduated. Right, right. So that makes sense that so you already had some experience in it. And we've, I've talked about that before too. Always try to find things you can, you already have experience in and that might be a niche or an area that would be good for you. Um, just because you've already got some knowledge, you're, you're not starting from zero, which was always nice. You started reselling and we're going to talk about your lifestyle here in a moment. <laughs> that sounded bad the way I said it, I think, but I don't mean it that way. Let's talk about the what. So you've decided to move into this reselling um, mode. So what sort of platforms are you selling on these days? I know you started with, I know you had some um, experience with like Craigslist and selling things like motorcycles and parts and things like that. But what sort of platforms are you selling on these days? What's maybe the the breakdown, if you could, if maybe just rough numbers, you know, what percentage do you sell this platform or this platform? Sure, sure. Uh, I would say about 30% would be Amazon and another 40% would be Facebook Marketplace right now. And then the rest would be split between Poshmark, Etsy, and eBay would be pretty rough. Of, uh, of whatever. Oh, actually I sell on Instagram too. So, th- so some, mm. throw some percents in there. Uh, it's such a weird platform to, to sell on because there's no structure. It's kind of just like post an item and then somebody messages you and then you figure out how to, how to get it to work. Yeah. But yeah, I would say throw, throw maybe 500 to a thousand dollars in Instagram sales every month. Okay. So you've got quite a mix there. Um, and that makes sense from like a diversification standpoint, if you know, if you got suspended on one of them or mm-hmm. something happened to that platform that made it not worth selling on, you've got a nice breakdown. So with that spread and so on, what sort of items are you focusing on these days? Do you have niches that you really go after? Is it more widespread? You know, what, what does that look like for you? Um, for the eBay, Etsy kind of stuff, I focus on items that I can sell for more than $50. So I've totally gotten away from picking up something to sell for like 10 bucks. Um, I always try to focus on things that are going to produce like a, ho- a higher ASP, especially for eBay. Cause it's the same amount of work listing, cleaning stuff for the most part, depending on the item. But I try to hit the uh, higher price points and maybe things with like less competition, very unique one-offs or vintage items that can command those, those prices. Um, when it comes to Facebook marketplace, I'm really focusing on technology right now. I've been doing a lot of computers. I've been doing computer services, which is kind of new. Um, people are actually paying me to fix their computers. So it's like, yeah, it's, it's into the more of a, a repeatable service that costs me nothing but time and the, the hard goods of the computers. Uh, on Facebook Marketplace, have been really getting into that over the last six months or so. so. So wait a minute, I want to stop you for a second. So how do you find, this is interesting, I didn't know you did this. So it's this it's so just developing, literally, like today I had a message from somebody that wanted to buy one, but I let them know I fix, and they're like, oh, well, I have two broken ones. Oh, so it's, so it's, is it something that you're directly advertising, or is it just kind of come about with situations like that? Situations like that, I have not directly advertised it yet, and I could, using Facebook Marketplace, like, just basic ads like, Hey, I fix computers or putting up signs around the city. I could do totally that. But right now I'm kind of seeing where just the organic, like word of mouth advertising gets. That is so cool. Um, that I had, wow. You may be developing your whole, a whole nother niche here. (laughs) It is. It's crazy. Like I accidentally started selling computers on Instagram and then I started posting them on Facebook marketplace and noticed how much of a need there is, especially right now with the whole virus stuff. A lot of people getting shifted to work from home, school from home, people need 
actual workstations or computers rather than just their mobile devices or tablets because of the screen uh, space. And just, it's, I don't know, for whatever reason, working on a computer, you get more done than working on mobile. It's just, yeah, I don't have the, the science or the stats to, to back it up, but it's, there's something about it. Yeah. Yeah. I think so too. That's odd. Um, but I think you're right. How do you find these days? How do you find inventory to sell? Now, obviously you mentioned computers and electronics and so on, but what are your primary methods for finding it these days? For these computers, um, anywhere from buying them off of Facebook marketplace, like I bought one yesterday off of Facebook marketplace that was underpriced. And I knew that that motherboard had the capability for a solid state drive upgrade. So I would kind of took advantage of that and bought from them, upgraded it, and then I'm gonna resell it on Facebook Marketplace. I've bought them off of eBay in lots, and then kind of fixed them up, split them off. And I've also bought from pawn shops. You're finding it through these different places. So what are you, what are you looking for in terms of, let's talk numbers here for a second. Okay, so which I don't have prepared at all. <laughs> <laughs> They'll gotcha. be very, very, very estimated, but I'll it's, try. It's a, very, it's a very gotcha kind of interview, not, yeah. not at all. Um, no, what, what I wanted to talk about was, what are you looking for? Because obviously you're dealing with electronics. Yes. Which, is, which are typically higher cost items to mm -hmm. source, higher uh, selling price items on the backside. So what are you looking for? I don't think, I don't know that average selling price is maybe the right term, but maybe it is. What are you looking to, how much are, how much are you limiting your risk on how much you spend on an item versus your return, your time to sell, you know, kind of that metric around, all right, I've got to spend $50 to make $150, but it might be tied up for three months or six months. Do you have a feel for that? Especially yeah, with these high I do. Dollars? I don't have like an exact rule because when I go into the pawn shops and kind of assess what they have, what they're looking to get rid of at what prices, sometimes I'll buy something that's complete trash just to help them out for possible future deals. I've bought things that I've broken even on. I've bought things that I've uh, recycled for them, maybe for like $5. But for the most part, I'll get. Um, any computer I've been able to sell for like at least a hundred bucks because of the need right now. It's crazy. Like even if it's a completely garbage computer, really, if it, if it's clean and it works and somebody can access the internet through it, it's like, for me, the bottom price is like a hundred bucks. And, and how much, can, how much time? Oh, I'm sorry. But I was just going to get one for like, take? it just, it totally would depend on the problem. Okay. Um, if the computer is ready to go, I could just wipe it down with the Clorox wipe. And I've had that happen where, the, the pawn shop maybe was the computer was so old in their inventory system to where they were just ready to get rid of it at cost or below cost. And I wipe it down with a Clorox wipe. It's good to go. Um, and then other ones I've had to order parts. For instance, I have a stack of parts next to me. I'm going to be working on computers. So that's like a week to two week turnaround time, depending on the eBay seller shipping stuff out and getting it to me. Yeah. And I was going to say all these old computers and so on. I mean, because new computers are, pretty pricey, especially when you get, you know, top of the line or right near the most current model. There's got to be just a huge market, I would think, for people who want working computers. You can access the internet, maybe do some basic productivity on them, but nothing really that fancy um, because yeah, most totally. a lot of people don't really need that. Yeah. And there's this huge disconnect from the consumer side where they, they're so overwhelmed by the choices and the prices when they go into Best Buy to mm. where they don't know. But when they see something that's just like, a hundred or 150 bucks, $200 price point. They're just like, okay, that's fine. Like they, they have this trust from a Facebook marketplace profile that does not exist with like a company or a store. It's, it's really, right. really weird. Do, do you find these people because they've seen you with that or because they have that trust around, you know, they see this as a real person. Do you find these people come back to you after the sale and ask you questions about, Hey, is this, how do I do this? Or, I mean, is there, is there another business model there too for like ongoing computer support? I haven't had people ask for support because I would offer support for free. So I don't really know how I would monetize that, but I've had had one guy contact me for another computer. Again, I've bought, I've had a guy buy two computers from me and then he gave me his to fix. And then just today, the lady I sold a computer to told me she has one with a cracked screen. No, it was not a cracked screen. It was just running slow. So I can kind of assess that would probably take, I don't know, 20 to 30 minutes to figure out 
to wipe it, clean it, make it run at least how it should from the factory, take off some software that's slowing it down. Um, just from talking to her, I'm, I'm starting to just ask people like, Hey, do you have ones that you need worked on? And even if I can only make 30 to 50, 60 bucks for a super simple service, the thing with computers is like, once you start the process, it kind of does it's, it's itself. Like it'll in, reinstall windows itself. It will format itself. Mm. You just have to basically put the commands in the first 50 seconds. And then it just runs for 15 to 30 minutes of the process. So I literally could have 20 computers done in an hour. If I just go like, boom, 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 boom around while they're kind of working themselves. If that makes sense. Yeah, no, that does make sense. They have become a lot simpler to install all those things on have them up and running. And obviously there's always going to be a need for people to have um, working technology, especially that's yeah, cheap, especially in a budget. Know. Yeah. The, yeah. the used pre-owned stuff, like it won't get hit with that 50% depreciation that you're mm-hmm. going to get. If you buy, I don't know, like an HP from Walmart brand new or right. something, you, you just get killed from the depreciation and the tax. No, that, I think that's, that's a terrific business model. Um, I want to shift gears for a moment because before you um, became an old married man, um, congratulations on that. I don't know if I ever told you that or not. <laughs> there it is. Um, got to, got to, got to keep the wife happy for sure. But before you did that, and not so long ago, you were in this process of not becoming, but being a digital nomad. People probably heard that term a lot in the last several years and so on. And there might be people out there listening today that thinks that this idea of, you know, driving around and, you know, supporting yourself by buying and selling things to sell online and uh, living in a van or uh, a vehicle of some sort sounds like a pretty cool thing to do. So I was wondering if you would share kind of what that process was like for you. And I know you've had an evolution um, over the last, you know, five, 10 years with all of that. Um, I was wondering if you could just share what that process looks like to doing that sort of thing. And do you think it's something the second question is, do you think it's something that today is uh, still a reasonable path for someone to follow if they want to, you know, buy and sell online? The way that I was doing it, it wasn't strictly to just drive around and buy stuff. Like I had a little bit more of a purpose with it. Mm -hmm. And now I was working a pharmacy contract out West uh, during my big, like 90 day, I think it was 90 days where I slept in my van. That was like the big, like nomadic thing. Um, but I had a contract out there. So I was kind of reselling on the weekends, traveling on the weekends, but working uh, Monday through Friday. And that was kind of the goal of the, the van build and just sleeping in the van because I didn't have a place to stay out there, saving money, don't have to get a hotel, but you could do it with a bigger vehicle if you have the budget, because it gets expensive when you start looking at RVs and sprinter vans and stuff. Um, I went with a Kia Sedona. It was like a $1,200 van. I put about $1,200 of upgrades into it, put a twin bed in the back, a cargo topper on top and some like stuff underneath where I would like store shipping labels and my, my printer and bags and some stuff on the cargo topper. But I wasn't just driving around to like buy and sell I think you would burn out just doing that. You would have to like, I want to go see this national park or I want to see like my buddy that I haven't seen that lives over in like Idaho. Like you'd have to plan things that are going to kind of keep you social along the way. You're going to want um, to really have a a comfortable bed in the van to sleep in. You really got to be like chasing like 70 degrees if you're in like these budget van builds. Um, to have these like comfortable sleeping temperatures, like things you don't think about unless you're actually in the, in the van trying to sleep, but it's like 90 degrees outside, but you really have to like plan with a lot of forward thought rather than just like throwing everything in van, start driving, like I'm gonna thrift along the way. Cause I, I've done that too. And it's like, it's not, it's not good. All right. So that's pretty cool. Um, about the nomading process. And I hadn't even thought about the temperature issue. I mean, I guess I would have known about that pretty quickly after one night in the van. And that totally makes sense that you have to chase, you know, the temperature as well as, as well as what you said about a lifestyle, like, you know, making interesting places to go. I think that's probably something people forget about because you can't just be um, business, business, business all the time. There's got to be some reason you're doing it. And I know you did a lot of content around that too. And if you guys want to check that on Eric's channel, we'll have some links to that here at the end of the, uh, the end of, end of the video and in the description. If you could go back 10 years ago, what kind of message would you send to younger Eric? What would you tell him? All right. 10 years ago, if I were talking to you, I would have said, get 
go on YouTube, start documenting when you're wrenching on the motorcycles, when you're doing the flip stuff, like way back in the day, the Craigslist meetups, you should have been recording all that. You should have been putting that on YouTube rather than just focusing on school. You should have done it. That's great. <laughs> I love that. Like you're very in your own face there. Um, yeah. I, I totally, I have no documentation of it other than like vague memories of, of like yeah. working on the motorcycles and stuff, even pictures. Like I don't even have pictures. This was all pre-smartphone. Mm. Yeah. Cause we really have no excuse now. I mean, we have the devices. Yeah. Um, we have the capability and people, and people get value from that. I think is what you're saying too, as well as you get value from it. You document, you see your journey and other people see that and they can use it as well. So you've kind of gone in this evolution from school to side hustle to nomading to now, I don't know if we're going to call you a computer repair person and seller yet. <laughs> it sounds like you're close and you've given like this path to success that, and, and married as well, which is another success in your life as well. And you kind of showed this path, you know, around the travel, around sell, uh, reselling, around your family connections and events and so on. I'm sure you've had your ups and downs like everybody else has, but if someone kind of follows your path, maybe not verbatim, but close, what would be some reasons that would maybe prevent them from succeeding? What might hold them back? Some things maybe that you had to overcome. You have to like, like for what I did, I went to college and then I kind of don't use my degree necessarily on like a higher level that a lot of people do. But I would say you have to enjoy school. And I, I did. I really, I really had no issue going to class. It was very structured, going to take tests and studying. Like You have to like that culture. You cannot think, I'm not going to be able to get into a, a nursing program. Or if you want to go to pharmacy school like I did, you can't think, like I'm never going to get into pharmacy school like I'm wasting my time. You can't be afraid of standardized exams. You can't be afraid of of student loans even because I took out student loans to get the degree, which was okay. I'm okay with that. Like the return on investment was there. So you have to kind of like think with that. I, I would tell myself 10 years ago that too, like think with forward thought of your degree versus how much it's going to cost versus your earning potential. Make sure the return is there and always have the side hustle and keep doing the side hustle. Like while you're doing all that at the same time. Oh, that's terrific. Um, I think that's great advice. And we could, we could spend um, a whole nother interview talking about college and education and loans. And um, it's beyond the scope of this interview for sure. But you had quite a journey in paying off your loans and so on. And there's a lot of great um, lessons you learned along the way. And I think people could really benefit from, from seeing your experiences with them. So what does the future look like for you in this style of business? What do you see? How do you see it going over the next year or three or five? I'm going to keep seeing how the computer thing goes. Um, I don't think it's like large. I haven't hit the, the cap yet because, you know, there's the scalability cap and you kind of like one man, you hit it, you, you peak and see like how much you really can do as one person. And I haven't hit that yet, but it's easily it's from what I'm looking at. It's easily like $50,000 plus a year with like minimum effort. And I'm, oh, wow. I've been posting out. So yeah, I've been posting out so much content. And that's just the computer part of it. Like what I've been calculating with the computer part of it. Um, I'm, I'm starting to put out more like how to videos on YouTube with like a certain repair. So if somebody wants to replicate that repair, but once you have like the basic foundations down, just it's the same with anything, you know, like with book selling, you have to learn like how the programs work. You have to learn how to read the data. You have to learn the processes. And it's the same thing with anything. Once you have that foundation, you can bring it up to a certain level as your own employee is one person, or you could try to see if you can scale past that with hiring employees, getting a space. I don't think I'm going to want employees or a space. I like staying kind of in my own apartment or, or if I ever get a house, be able to stay there and work out of there. But I, I do want to see like how I, how far I can take that because the, the money's there. The money's definitely there in the right, um, the right neighborhoods and places. Hmm. No, that's great. And I just wanted to ask you along those lines, you know, with this new, this path you're going on and just this evolution you've been on, how do you know if you're successful, Eric? Ooh, uh, it's such an opinion, opinionated question because I don't see myself as successful, but somebody that maybe is like a freshman in college is like, oh, he graduated. So I guess that's the success. Hmm. But um, there's so many definitions of success. I mean, I feel like if I've 
inspired one person on Instagram that I actually got a message the other day saying, Hey, I've, act, I've started my own computer servicing business. I've got three clients already and I've made $65 a client literally from watching my Instagram story. Like, I feel like that's a success. For sure. Helping others, giving back is a, that's a success. It's hard to put a dollar figure on for sure. So if you had a tip to give to somebody, if they were starting out on this sim, maybe a similar journey to yours, and again, everybody's going to have their own path, their own way they're doing things, they're going to have their own backstory, their own set of skills. But what would what tip would you give to somebody who maybe wants to go down this reselling, this reselling avenue? You know, how how would you maybe encourage them? Maybe not so much a tactic, but more like, you know, an overall mindset and a strategy. What would you want to say to that person if they said, "Hey, I'm thinking about reselling for side gig, a a hustle, a full-time, you know, whatever their parameter is, what would you say to them? It's really, really important to stay organized because if you're doing something you love and you're not organized with it, you're going to feel overwhelmed. If you're doing something that you kind of feel like a grind with, but you're organized, you're going to feel a lot better with it. So if you're processing like hundreds or thousands of books, uh, having it all over your apartment. As I can tell, like your, your place is very clean. You are always very organized with your gene system. And I know that would be way better than if somebody just went to the bins and like threw a bunch of clothes, like all over their house, like staying somewhat organized with a system makes it so much more enjoyable. For sure. No, that's a great tip. So Eric, how can people reach out and connect to you if they want to find out more about what you're, what you got going on and, And uh, what sort of side courses you're hustling here on computer repair? (laughs) I don't have any courses yet. I'm trying to put out some YouTube content just on very simple repairs. So you can reach out in YouTube comments, but the best place is always Instagram. It's basically like text messaging because you have such instant access to somebody. uh, And it's, it's just the best way. I always read through my DMS. I'm not saturated there yet. I'm getting close to not being able to get back to everybody. But for the most part, um, just hit me up on Instagram and I'll try my best to help you with any specific questions that you have. All right. Well, that's going to do it. Eric, thank you very much for coming on today. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me.